Uh, evening folks, my name is Simon Brown. <coughs> so this evening we're looking at risk management. This is number 12 in the series. We started in July of last year and it's quite wild to think that we're now 12 months on. Uh, those are the first 11 all on justonelap.com slash bootcamp. Um, we're now good doing the risk part of it. We have certainly touched on risk in places. We purposely left risk right for the end so we could now wrap it all and bring it all together in, in one sense. Um, and that is the bootcamp. This is now bootcamp is done. We've got the videos. There's now 12 hours of content. They're on the website and they will be there forever and a day. You're welcome to it. What we now kick off with uh, next month is what we call the masterclass, which is where we're taking these boot camps and the plan is, is to move them into the, the, the real world in a sense. So what we'll do, each of the sessions will be a, a double session. The first will be here at IG and webcast and we will go through a trading system top to tail, the entire process of it, your, your risk management, your entries, your exits, your targets, how you do stop losses, the whole component of it. And then we follow up with the webcast two weeks later where we, we do it during the day hours and we do it practically on the IG platform so that we can say, right, this is the theory, now let's put this into practice. Um, and we've, we've got six of them scheduled between now uh, and down to December. First one is 19 July. If you go to justonelap.com slash events, uh, and then they will all sit under the masterclass once they start getting uploaded. The first one, as I said, 19 July, follow up then 2nd of August. That one is open. The first part of the se session is here, all webcast. The second is webcast only. But as always, the videos will be available online. Um, so, yeah, it, it, the, one of the things with trading is that we take risk and the point with the risk is that if we don't manage it properly, it's really quite simple. It is game over. If we, you know, we, we I know what happens, we lose our money and we say, no, nah, but we can load more money in. Well, we can, but that, that kind of defeats the purpose. If we keep on just busting out and taking more money in, we, we're, we're better off going on holiday or, or giving it to a worthy cause or, or buying wine or, or something like that. We've got to be ruthless with our losses. Um, and if you've ever been to a presentation of mine, you've seen this presentation. So Van K, this, this slide, Van K. Thop, who is the guru on, on risk and the like, he ran a system during the late 90s where he literally used a dart and a coin. He would toss a dart at the wall of the S&P 500 stocks, where it landed, that's the share that he would trade, toss a coin, heads he would buy it, tails he would sell it. That system beat the market every quarter for three years. A dart and a coin. Why? No big losses. It's that simple. It wasn't a magic dart and it wasn't a magic coin. And when I emailed him a couple of years ago, many years ago, and said, why don't you trade the dart and the coin system? He says, because look, dart and, dart, dart and coin is 50-50. You do a 721 moving average crossover. You're at 51-49. Slightly better odds. But the key point is, those five trades are random distribution. Uh, what we're not taking into account here is costs and spread and the like, but let's park that for now. That random distribution will happen, and in theory, your portfolio will go sideways. You bring costs into the equation, you bring slippage, you bring spread into the equation. In truth, your portfolio slowly goes to zero. All we have to do, the one single thing we have to do, is make sure we never have a big loss. That's it. The truth of the matter is, is that big profits are a little bit of a rare beast. Now, how often do you buy something and it goes up, I don't know, 20, 50, 100 percent? I mean, it depends how we're defining big profit. It happens, but it's not a common occurrence. Um, but the big losses can be a very common occurrence. Every single trade could be a big, a big loss. So in truth, we skew this process by having a lot more big losses than we do have corresponding big profits. So we actually just make it worse. What we have to do is make sure no big losses. CNBC had their trader challenge a couple of years ago and I was working on the first one and one of the sessions there was some challenge and if you won it you could have any trade reversed and I hadn't realized before and if you think about it, if you've been trading and you think about the last year or so of trading when I say you can reverse one of your trades two things jump to mind firstly you're saying only one and secondly you know which one it is and it's a big loss one it always is and how do we prevent a big loss it's the simplest thing in the world stop loss. We have a preordained price at which we exit the trade, no questions asked. A price point and the downside, 
So we get in it, we buy something at 10 Rand, we're long, we're expecting it to go higher, and we say, if it falls to whatever, 9, 8, 7, 9.50, we'll pick a price. If it falls to that level, we exit this trade every single time, no questions asked. And it's so easy to stand up here and to say it. And it's so incredibly hard to do it. Trust me, I know, I've been there. But what makes me a profitable trader? Because I would never use the lexicon of good trader, but what makes me a profitable trader is that since April 2000, every single time a stop loss of mine has been hit, I have exited. Every single time. 16 years and two months without fail. And sometimes my stop loss is 10 Rand and the market's at 9 Rand. What do I do? I exit every single time for 16 years. That's why I make money. Because I don't have the big losses. I got zip of them. I mean, I got some losses that are bigger than I would like because my stop got missed. I, absolutely. But I've never held on past the stop loss. And I must, I must quantify this and say that I specify April 2000. I must point out I started trading in April 1995. And for five years, I thought stop losses were for other people. I had a special touch, you see. When I bought a share, it didn't matter. It was going higher in time. Um, so I'll quickly tell you the one share I bought in 1996. I paid 20,000 Rand for it and it got delisted about two years ago and I got 52 Rand. Over an 18 year period I turned 20,000 into 52 because stop losses were for other people. And the worst part is at one point that 20,000 was worth 120,000. Um, and I didn't believe in stop losses. And the reason I didn't believe in them because they were painful and because I was losing money and because it wasn't fun. Um, and, and, you know, we all have that time when you exited on a stop and it went to the moon without you. So when I say stop loss, something comes into everyone's brain. And what comes into your brain is that time when it went down to your stop loss and you got out and before you could blink, man, something had happened and the stock was up, you know, at the moon on the way to Mars. <coughs> Every one of you, that's imprinted into your brain. But there's another picture out there as well, which you don't have in your brain, but which is as important. The time when you ignored your stop loss and you still own that, that, that share. If it's a geared position, you don't. So here I've got a chart of Kumba. Up here are these two white lines. We have a lovely, I don't know what you call that, a pennant or a flag, lovely little pattern -y there. Uh, off it breaks, continuation pattern, retest of it. Boom, off it goes. Man, you can smell the riches. You're going to make so much money that in kind is going to be petty cash for you. <laughs> and then it collapses. Oh, small, ah, oh, but it bounces. Ah, boom, we're in business. And the whole way down, it's oops, boom, oops, boom, until eventually Kumba's 26 rand. Now, the truth is that if you did this in a geared position, it matters not because you got completely wiped out long before it got to 25 rand. Um, if you were doing it ungeared, you still hold that Kumba. And you, many of you will have that share, and it might, you know, it might, it's probably a junior mining stock. But you know what the share is, because when you log into your portfolio and you see it, you get this horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. Yeah. You bought it because this was going to be the next NASPAS. Instead, it fell down its own mine shaft. You can't sell it because brokerage is more than the cost of what you will receive for selling it. You, also will, you, you will sell it when it reaches break even. Here's the honest truth. That share will reach break even when your grandchildren get to retirement. Here's what you do because this share is causing you pain and suffering. The money is gone. Hey, that money is lost is lost. The money is gone. This share is causing you pain and suffering. So what you do tomorrow morning, 9.30, log on to the account, sell it. Sell it. It's causing you pain. You know, it's like having dinner with your ex-wife every night. No. <laughs> You loved her once, but she's an ex-wife. Let someone else have dinner. You find a new wife to have dinner with. Sell it. Make it gone. And then the extra point is, delete it from your watch list and never look at it again. So I have that share. You'll note when I tell you about the share that went 20,000, 120,000, 52 rand, I don't tell you the name of the share because I don't like to speak of such things. <laughs> Sell that share. So the point is, is that this chart exists in your life too. And as much as you remember the time when it came down and hit your stop loss and you exited and it went to the moon without you, we forget about this time. 
we actually don't forget. We lie to ourselves. We pretend we forget. What you need to do is make this the picture that comes to mind when you say stop loss. If you want, drop me a mail. I will send you the, this chart. This is Kumba. Uh, I try to find the African bank chart, which is way better, because that goes to zero. Because you know the question, hey, how low can it go? You know the answer to how low can it go? Two words, African bank. If you want to be simple, it's zero. I like to complicate and make it two words. That's how low it can go. How low can any stock go? Zero. Any stock in the world. African bank was a top 40 share. One point, one of the top 10 holdings of unit trusts in South Africa. Now it is gone. So this is what we need to look at. Print it out, stick it next to your computer screen, make it your screensaver, make it your home screen in your phone, keep a piece of paper in your wallet, I don't know, put it in the steering wheel in your car, stuff like that. This is what we need to remember. Not the moonshot that left us behind. You know what? The moonshots are going to leave us behind sometimes. The point is, is that because we exited, it means we get to live and try again. And one day we will be on that. Those moonshots are frankly lucky. No one buys a share and says, this thing's going up a thousand percent. I mean, your friends would, you, know, you, you would be crazy. But sometimes you buy a share and something happens. I mean, my example, I, I bought it the beer's warrant. I bought it in the morning. I paid, I forget the exact numbers. I think I paid 45 cents for it. <coughs> Two hours later, Anglo announces they're doing a takeover of the beers. My 45 cent warrant goes to seven rand. Two hours. I didn't buy it for to go to seven rand. It didn't change my life because I hadn't bought enough of them because of course I'm risk adjusted. It's going to happen sometimes. But they just come along randomly. And if you're a disciplined trader, when they come along, you will still be in the game. They will happen for you. But if you're not a disciplined trader and you're holding these stocks to the bottom, you're out of the game. And I don't care what the company is. It doesn't matter. Remember, we're traders, right? What matters? Price. Price is your only truth. And what is that Kumba price? So at the top up here, what is the Kumba price telling us? Well, it's telling us unsure. Ah, we can make some arguments for lower lows, which is negative, etc., etc. But pretty much after that second boom, this price is telling us one thing. We are going down. And it's really simple. If a stock's going down, what do you do? You short it. You sell what's going down, you buy what's going up. How do you know what's going down? Look at the chart. Look at the price. If in doubt, ask a six-year-old. Well, they got no airs and graces. They look at it. And I do it with my, I was in, when I was in Durban a few months. In fact, my niece was up here in Joburg. She turned six last week. I did the test with her. So I get her a chart. In fact, I use Comba. I said to her, so which way is this going? And she looks at me like there's a trick question. I said to her, no, just what? She says, it's going down. <coughs> like, this is a stupid question. Um, I go to NASPAS. She's like, it's going up. And then I go to the top 40. She's like, that's going nowhere. And she was right in all three, eh? <laughs> and she's six. So, as I said, so first point is, yes, th there is that time. I know. And it will happen to you. See, so here's the point of a stop loss. A stop loss is designed to taunt you. A stop loss is designed to cause you pain and suffering. But most importantly, a stop loss is designed to keep you in the game. Because without it, it is game over. That's supposed to be a little flashing GIF, but apparently GIFs don't work with little flashy things in this environment. So stop loss, we're going to come back to. When we think risk management, we always think about stop loss, which is correct. But there's a bigger issue out there. How many of whatever it is we're trading do we buy? If you're buying an equity, how many do you buy? If you're taking a position on an index or an FX, how big a position do you take? Typically what we've done is we've got a portfolio and either we put 100% of it in, in other words we buy as much as the broker will let us and we gear it to the max, or we've thought, oh no, 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 that's a bit risky, I know what I'll do, I'll divide my portfolio into three pieces and I'll put a third into each. What that basically gives you is your risk is all over the place. Some trades have got small risk, some trades have got massive risk. There's no continuity of risk in that sense. What we need to do is manage that position size. And we do that quite simply with something called the 2% rule. The 2% rule is about how much cash do we have at risk in any one trade. 2% rule is how much cash, how much of your hard-earned money do you have in any one trade in any one time. If we don't have a 2% rule, how much money do you have at risk? Quite simply, what is your net worth? 
because you can hold that position and take margin calls from your broker until such time as you can't pay the margin calls. Now, in truth, you're going to bail, hopefully, long before you've run through your net worth. But the truth is, is that you, you don't have a quantifiable number. So the 2% rule says, how much at risk in any one trade? And the answer is never more than 2%. So if your portfolio is 50,000 Rand, how much at, at risk do you have in a trade? 1,000 Rand. That means you have to have 50 losing trades in a row to go bankrupt. Anyone had 50 losing trades in a row? I mean, I've been trading 21 years. I haven't even done 50 losers in a row. I mean, quite frankly, if you do 50 losers in a row, turn the chart around. <laughs> you got it upside down. <coughs> it's not going to happen. And I, I preface it by saying, if you're a disciplined trader sticking to a methodology, you're not going to have 50 losing trades in a row. You can toss a coin. You can get heads a lot of times. You're not going to get it 50 times in a row. It's just not going to happen. Uh, the, the science says no chance, but the practical says absolutely no chance. So you never risk more than 2% of your cash in a single trade. This is how the process works. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, and I, I'm not going to move on until everyone's happy, because this is important. So if you're not getting it, don't worry. We've got questions. We won't leave you behind, because this is really, really important. So how does that process work? You get the buy signal or a sell signal, but let's say a buy signal. So you look at your chart tonight and it says, oh, you must buy that share and you must buy it and it's trading at whatever, 10 Rand or something, whatever the case may be. You get the buy signal, you then determine the stop loss. So you're looking at the chart, it says you must buy this share. What do you do? You look at, we we'll find out what is your stop loss. You don't actually know what price you will pay for the share yet because when the market opens tomorrow, the share might be higher, it might be lower. You don't know what the price is you'll pay, but you do know what your stop loss will be because you've got the chart in front of you. So you determine your stop loss level. You then discover tomorrow your entry price and from that you determine your position size. And that tells you how many to buy. So let's look at it practically. 50,000 Rand portfolio. 2% means you can risk 1,000 Rand in any one trade. You're buying a share. You discover when you come to the market that your share is going to cost you 12 Rand to purchase it. Your stop loss, which you had determined last evening, was 11 Rand. So risk per instrument, or in this case, share, is 1 Rand, right? You would buy at 12, and if you got stopped immediately, you would lose 1 Rand. Makes sense. So how many shares do you buy? Well, you divide your one rand into your 1,000 and you buy 1,000 shares. If it's CFDs, you buy 1,000 CFDs. If it's uh, 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 indices that you're trading and you're trading points um, and you're trading two rand a point, sorry, you, you've got a 500 point stop loss, you can take two rand a point. This tells you how many to buy. What this means, so there's one trade, another trade. Same entry, but different stop. This time the stop is 10 Rand. So risk per instrument, 2 Rand. Number to buy, 500. Another example. Entry, still 12 Rand. Different stop loss, 11 Rand 50. Risk per instrument, 50 cents. Number to buy, 2,000. Three trades. They could all be different instruments. Every one of them has 1,000 Rand at risk. What does this mean? It means a bunch of things. Firstly, it means assuming you are comfortable with losing a thousand rand in a single trade, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Assuming you're comfortable with that, is every trade has the same level of risk. When I started trading, I used to buy 10,000 warrants. Whether the warrant cost me 30 cents or two rand, I bought 10,000. Whether my stop loss was 10% or 50%, I bought 10,000. So some of my trades, I was risking a vast amount of money, and other trades, I was risking half a bottle of wine, cheap wine at that. This means every trade has exactly the same risk. It means every trade is technically the same. They're all running at that same risk level. It means you don't get stressed by certain trades. In fact, what's important is that that 1,000 Rand needs to be an amount of money that does not stress you. If you're stressed by 1,000 Rand, you're not going to be able to do the stop loss. What happens? You log on to your, to your broker platform and you see uh, loss, 6,500. And what does your brain do? 6,500 is a completely meaningless number. It means nothing. 
Yeah, as a as a exact six and a half thousand. But your brain says, well, what is six and a half thousand? Oh, it's Tunda Seaswear school fees. Whoa, Tunda Seaswear's not going to school. Panic stations. Can't do the stop loss. If I exit this trade, no education for Tunda Seaswear, where's my retirement coming from? Your brain will find something to latch on to. You make it a small enough amount where it's 1,000 Rand. And my advice to you, a good idea is to go and draw 1,000 Rand from an ATM. And that's terrible advice because we live in South Africa. Go get a friend to draw a thousand rand from an ATM. <laughs> you just want to look at it. You just want it to be their thousand rand in case someone swipes it. You want to look at this thousand rand and physically look at, at a thousand rand and 20 and 50 rand notes. Don't do hundreds and 200 rand notes, but look at it as a pile of money and look at it and it, it, it's really insignificant and unscary. And then next time when you log on and you've got a thousand rand loss, your brain says, yeah, but remember, like I drew it out the ATM man, and it didn't even make a bulge in my wallet. A thousand bucks is nothing. Your brain's now got something it can latch onto instead of school fees and retirement funds and all of those sort of things that are going to scare the behectness out of us. You, you, you've, you've hacked your brain. So every trade comes at exactly the same amount of risk. Some trades will have you know, more margin to them. Some of them will have more, more contracts to them, whatever the case may be. But your random risk is the same. What, you note what I'm not telling you here. The stop loss is not 2%. Here we've got a 50 cent on 12 rand. Now, uh, that is approximately 4 and a quarter percent. Here we have got... Um, We've got 2 Rand on 12 Rand, approximately 15% stop loss. Here we've got 1 Rand on 12 Rand, approximately 8.25%. So how we determine the stop loss is a different process, and I'm coming to that in a moment. This just tells you how many to buy. That's what's critically important. Typically, what we do is buy too many. Absolutely, we, offer, we mostly buy too many. And we run this through, as I said, we know what the stop loss level is. Um, when we enter the position, we'll know what the entry is, and then we know how many to purchase. What it also means is as a market gets more volatile and starts to bounce around more, your stop loss can widen because you're still running the same risk. All it means is your stop loss widens, you buy less. As a market gets range bound and you're trading a break from a range, you can tighten your stop loss. And it means you take a technically larger position, but same amount of risk. So as markets get volatile, your, your position sizes reduce. As markets reduce their volatility, they can increase. So you get into sync with the market. Does this make f sense to folks? Because this is critical. So the argument is around the 2% rule is, well, what percent is right? So. I mean, the short answer is I, I, I actually typically run slightly below 2%. Um, I've got a buddy in Australia who, <coughs> excuse me, who ran the numbers using the NASDAQ, and he said 0.8%. Um, I've run the numbers using 5%, and that doesn't work. The problem with 5% at risk is are you going to have 20 losing trades in a row? Probably not. But are you going to probably at some point have 10 losing trades in a row? Yes. And if you're running 5% risk per trade, you've lost half of your portfolio. You know how you get back from losing half of your portfolio? You've got to do 100% growth. Whereas if you're at 2% risk and you lose 10 trades in a row, you're down to 80%. How do you get back to where you started? 25% growth in your portfolio, you're back at the beginning. The guy running 5% has got to double his money. You double your money, you're 60% in the profit. So it, it reduces your drawdown. Drawdown is how much do you lose when you go in that losing streak. And you will have losing streaks. And my, my view is when, you, when you're co contemplating what a losing streak will be, you've got to say at least 10 trades. Maybe 12 or 15. 20's un, I mean, 20 is really going to be hard. And in truth, excuse me, once you're hitting 10 or 15 losing trades, they're not all going to be full losses. Right, because your stop loss was 11 rand and the stock ran to 13 and you moved your stop loss to 11 rand 50. And then it came and stopped you out. You didn't lose 1,000 rand, you only lost 500 rand. 
So even a run of losing trades won't all be at max drawdown. Certainly, you can push it to maybe 2.5%. Once you start hitting 3%, it's too big. Once you hit 4 or 5%, it's structurally too high risk. So there's some problems with 2%. Um, and, and some of you have probably spotted it already. And I need to get to... Well, you don't get rich in a hurry. If you're only risking 2%, you're not going to get rich in a hurry. In truth, if you, do a, if, you, if you get a trade that doubles its money, you're not only going to make 2%, because again, let's go back to the example. Your stop loss was 12 rand, your, sorry, 10 rand, your, your entry was 12 rand, you took uh, uh, 500 shares. If that share goes to 24 rand, you've made, you've made 6,000, whereas you risked 1,000. So you've made six times your money at risk. 100% return in a share is a rarity, but nonetheless, you know, we're just running with numbers that are easy to compute in my head. But certainly, you're not going to, you know, the way to get rich is really, really quite simple, is to find that stock that's going to go up to the moon and make, you know, gear yourself as much as possible on that share. The problem is if you get it wrong, you don't get rich, you get poor. And we don't know which stock's going to the moon tomorrow, so the odds are you will just get poor instead. So yeah, you know, trading is not about getting rich in a hurry. <coughs> It, it, you know, it, this is the 12th booth camp we have done. We have never proposed that this was how you get rich in a hurry. One way we get rich in a hurry. Marry money. Some of you have heard that from me before. It's not about lottos. It's, not about, it, it's, about, it's about process. Trading can add to an income. And in time it can become significant and it's an easy way to do it. The most important point, particularly when we're starting, is about staying in the game. Because when we're out of the game, it don't matter nothing no more. So yeah, we, because we're taking lower risk, we're going to make money slower. But we're going to make the money because we're going to stay in the game. We will be around in six months and a year and five years and ten years. You know, I, I'm able to say that I've been trading profitably for 16 years and some months. The reason I do that is because I stopped taking the flyers in the 90s and because I actioned my stop losses. So the problem is, it's with the 50,000 Rand portfolio, it was nice and simple. With the 5,000 Rand portfolio, your 2% is 100 bucks. And then the numbers just don't work out anymore. So the short answer is 5,000 is a small amount to start with. What it then says is, well, what do you trade? So if you come with 5,000 Rand, you, you trade a, a, <coughs> a, a mini futures contract which is two, two rand a point, so it's two and a half thousand points before you bust out. If you've got 5,000 rand, I don't believe you can trade equity. You certainly can't on 5,000 rand do a proper risk-adjusted portfolio trading equity. It's just not viable. To trade equity, you probably need a minimum of 20 or 30,000. 50 is probably idealish. Quick aside, if you've got 50 and never traded before, don't jump in as a newbie with your full 50,000 because you're going to make mistakes and lose it. Put 40 somewhere nice and safe and jump in with 10. So when you lose that, and when I say lose that, you know, almost wiping out a portfolio is almost a rite of passage that traders have to go through. Um, I mean, I don't know, the, the successful traders here, did, did you, I mean, do you write a portfolio? Do you, uh, yeah. In a month. That was quick. I wiped out three. Um, the third one I wiped out in four days because by then I was an expert at wiping out portfolios. <laughs> um, the problem was I was trading. I didn't even know what the product was. But anyway, that's another story. You know, taking those losses, we need to do it because it focuses our mind. It, 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 it's a it's a critical part of, of that process. So, yeah, if you've got a smaller portfolio, you've got to be more selective about what you trade because otherwise you simply can't do proper risk adjustment. Um, <coughs> costs. I haven't included costs into that equation at all. How we put costs is fairly quite simple. So, onto our entry price, we add costs, and onto our exit price, we subtract costs. And then we run those numbers. Now, I'm lazy. That's like, to me, smacks a lot of hard work. So what I do, instead of uh, including into price or subtracting out of price, I use a 1% rule. So when I'm entering a trade, I'm risking 1%, not 2%. So I'm pulling my trade sizes down even further. 
And that means I can ignore my costs. There's another reason why I use 1% and I'll get to that in a second. But I'm running at a 1% rather than 2%. So the costs to me are built into that extra, the difference between 1% and 2%, my costs hide themselves in there. Does this make sense? Getting large amounts of nodding. I'm not getting any terribly confused smiles. If you wake up in the morning and it didn't make sense, drop me a mail, head the website. There, there, there's a 40-minute video on this alone because of its critical importance. Go and, and search for the 1% the on there and, and you're in biz. Uh, again, slippage, same deal as costs. Um, one of the benefits of, of some platforms, IG offers it, is a guaranteed stop loss. What I mean by slippage is your stop is 10, but the stock opens at 9. And you're like, whoa, that's going to hurt. So IG says, don't worry, we will guarantee you a 10 rand stop loss. They charge you. There's a cost associated. It's an insurance policy. You know, it's like, you know, we insure our home. We don't wake up in the morning and say, dang, we weren't robbed. We can't claim insurance. Um, you buy an insurance policy on your stop loss, which guarantees your stop loss. And then, you know, you get out and you get out at a price that you're happy with. So that's 2%. Alexander Elder talks about the 6% rule. He says that you want to have no more than 6% of your portfolio at any one point in time at risk. Um, there's a video at just one lap on this. I'm not going to delve into it because I'm not convinced by his logic or his theory. And in fact, I think it's better covered by your overall margin and leverage on a portfolio. And we discussed that in uh, video number two, margin, leverage, and exposure. So head off to the bootcamp series. You'll find the video there. But if you've read about the six or heard about the 6% rule, it's a different rule. And I think there's better ways. So I'm telling you about it, but I'm telling you I don't subscribe to it. I'm parking it. You can go and find if you want more or go check that video, which will give you what I consider a better way. And what that basically is saying is don't we're talking at the 2% rule about individual trades. This says, what about your portfolio as a whole? Because if you take 50 trades all at 2% and the market gaps down 10%, uh, it doesn't matter that you were 2%, you're wiped out anyway. So it's about managing the overall risk of your portfolio. So then comes the hard part, where to place a stop loss. So I remember in the early days of my trading, I was working with a chap called Manfred Harbeck. He was my colleague at SA Warrants. Um, and, and Manfred, is a, he's a rocket scientist. He used to make rockets for Denel. He's a proper certified rocket scientist. And we figured that math could help us understand where to place a stop loss. We figured math can solve any problem in the world, and stop losses were no exception. So we got a whole lot of data and a whole bunch about, I don't know, eight or 10 of the top 40 stocks at that point in time. And we got uh, end of day data going back about 10 years, and we chucked it into an Excel spreadsheet, and he wrote a formula to determine the best place to position the stop loss. Um, the, the, the spreadsheet was such, he lives in Somerset West. When he turned that spreadsheet on, Western Cape went dark. And <laughs> it wasn't a Bolt and Kuberg, it was Manfred's Excel spreadsheet. It ran for four and a half days. And it came back, and if you've read uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it gave the answer as 42. Basically, it said, for any period in the past, we know exactly where to position the stop loss. For any period in the future, we don't have a single clue, not even a guess. Because we know where we want our stop loss, right? If a stock is going to collapse and then rally to new highs, you want the stop loss one cent below that low. If a stock is going to collapse into a heap, you want the stop loss one cent above the high. That's what we're looking for. Perfect stop losses. Welcome to stop losses. They are here to taunt you. They are going to cause you pain. They are going to cause you suffering. But most importantly, they will keep you in the game. So we put up with the pain and the suffering. We're desperate to try and find the perfect place. And it's just not there. What we need to do is have a, a, a methodology, a school of thought, so that whatever we do do is replicable. Yeah, and it's what I always say, we need that discipline because we need to know that what, what we did in this stop loss, we can do again and again and again. So you can't ask the six-year-old for a stop loss because she's going to pick a different level every time, you know, depending on whether she liked her breakfast or, or uh, I don't know, six-year-old, whatever. So it's not a perfect science and you will get shaken out. Now, 
You're going to get shaken out by markets that just collapse and then run without you. You're also going to get shaken out, particularly trading the large stocks, particularly if you're trading index futures and if you're trading currency futures. What I mean by shaken out, the market looks at it and says, I bet you there are a lot of stop losses sitting there. And I bet you if I run the market to that point, those stops will all trigger and I can buy them nice and cheap and then it'll run back up. And you know what, if I'm JP Morgan or whoever, some big trader somewhere, I can run that market. I can move a market. I can move the Aussie future for about f two minutes. I can't keep it there. To keep it there, I need to be Warren Buffett. But to move an index 100, 150 points, I can do that easy enough. But if, you, if your stops are being shaken out, you're, hiding in, you're putting them in too simple a place. Stop losses is like hide and seek. If you've always been found first at hide and seek, you're no good at hide and seek. You need to hide better. <laughs> it's not that that seeker has x-ray vision, it's that your hiding lacks ability. And in stop losses, what's the first rule of stop loss? Put it where no one expects it to be. Put it where you say the market will not go. And those two will conflate on a particular point. And then put your stop loss there. So, give it space. What do we typically do? We make our stop loss too small. We make our stop loss too small because we're worried about losing money. Notwithstanding, we're going to ignore the stop loss anyway, but let's pretend we're not. So we make it too tight. Someone sneezes at the JSC, and ching, ching, and you're stopped out. The other thing we do is now I've come up with this 2% rule, and you're like, yo, so I'm going to reduce my trade size. I know what I'll do. 12 Rand stock, stop loss, ha, 11 Rand 98. <laughs> I can buy 20,000 shares. You can, and you will own them for all of three seconds. And then you'll get stopped out. So give it space. So there's two ways broadly we do it. The first is with the eye. What I mean is look at the chart. It can be biased. Why? Well, because we are human beings. We look at a chart. We're going to be, I mean, we're not going to be fair and honest. We're going to bring our biases and, and the like to it. Um, I, I'm actually quite a fan of using an eye, uh, doing it by eye, although oddly enough, typically I don't, but that's because of how I've, the systems I've ended up trading in my life. Um, for example, below recent lows, below breakouts, trend lines, where it will not go. So here is a chart. This happens to be the ND25. It happens to be a weekly chart. None of that is relevant. What it is is a pair of chart. The first thing, when looking at a stop loss, candles. You have to use candles because these candles tell you. So a line chart just tells you the close. Nice, but useless. Candles tell you open high, low, close. They give you a lot more information. So this happens to be a trade that I'm currently in on the ND. I got in on that candle there. <coughs> Where would I put a stop loss? The first obvious one is this white line here, which is below the recent low. So there's a recent low, those two candles there a couple of weeks back. Boom, boom. Don't put it on the low. Don't sort of zoom in and get it to the tenth of a point. No, no. Put it a little wiggle room below. How much wiggle room? I don't know, quarter percent, half a percent. Put it a little bit below that. But that's a relatively short-term low. That's candles only... So I entered on this green candle here, for those on the webcast, three green candles back. I was putting it on a low that it occurred in the previous two candles. So if we haven't got this information, I would have done the second line down, which is a much more substantial low. So what have we got? We've got all of this activity, which again, this is a weekly chart, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've got eight candles which convalesced around that middle white line. That tells me that there's something happening down here. That there's some support, there's some mystical beast comes out when the market moves down to that point. So I much prefer that. But then I look at the, at the wicks and I'm like, yeah, okay, but maybe I should go down to below. The, so the lowest white candle, but man, now that thing is a million miles away. So what I would probably do is put it on this middle one here. Because if you are buying on this candle here, which is three green candles back for the folks in the webcast, that's a nice space down. You're saying this market's going higher. It's got to go a fair bit lower before you're wrong. That gives you a lot of wiggle room. I like wiggle room. Remember, I want to do less trades. Because every time I do a trade, I've got to cross the spread. It costs me money. Every time I do a trade, I've got to pay the broker a fee costs me money. Every time I do a trade, my stop loss is a full maximum part away. 
I'm at max risk. I want to do as few trades as possible rather than as many trades as possible. So if I use the top white line, that's going to be a much more aggressive one. And it's a decision you've got to say to yourself. How do you want to trade? <coughs> Excuse me. Do you want to trade very aggressively? It's fine. Top one. You want to trade you know, less aggressively? Then I would go for the middle white line there. And what I would probably do on this lowest wick, I would probably put it about halfway down, which takes it into line with that red and green wick just running across there. So I would probably have put my stop loss at about that point there. I like the parallel lines rather than, than, than angular. I'll come to them in a moment. My reason for liking parallel lines is that these are price points. And price points stick in people's brain. So let's say this is not an index. Let's say this is a, a share. And let's say this, white, this middle white line is at 10 Rand. Every time the share gets to 10 Rand, people are going to remember. And what are they going to remember? That when it gets to 10 Rand, it typically bounces. So what are they going to do? They're going to want to buy it. So what we're going to be seeing happening here is that memory effect. Now, you know, down the line, the 10 Rand moves on, and now they start focusing on a new level. But in this case, we're only a couple of candles into their rears. That 10 Rand is going to be important to them. The market is made up of people. And in some cases, it's machines. But those machines were programmed by people. And people have memories. You know, people remember, oh, yeah, this thing, 10 Rand, yes, it was there back whenever... Hey, have a look. Oh, look what happens when it gets there. Which is why I like those parallel lines. But if you want to go for the trend line, same picture. There you're just drawing your trend lines. The debate then is do you draw to the wicks or to the, to, the, to the actual bodies? I typically do the bodies. What this gives me is a slightly more aggressive trend line. So now I've got a much more aggressive stop. What I was doing at this point here was on that candle purchasing there, my stop loss is, is close. It's also perhaps not a very smart stop loss because I'm stopping at that point there, right? Where that white line ends. But just a little bit below it are those double candles there. And a little bit below that is the 60 EMA. So that might not be the cleverest place to put it. I go again back to this one. You know, maybe my top one, but I certainly like my, my middle white line. Is there a perfect place to put it? No. There is not. What you've got to do is come up with an idea, a concept, a theory that makes sense to you, something that you can explain to yourself, and something that you can replicate. And, and go do a test. Go get the top 40 shares in the JSC and put a stop loss in every single one. You don't have a trade, but just go draw, put, put a stop loss, put, put a stop loss in every single one. Make it an alert so you get an email when they trigger. And start watching the stocks. And if you trade indices, do it on indices. If you trade currencies, do it on currencies. And start placing stop losses where you don't have skin in the game. And see what happens. See what seems to work. And make notes. Say, right, when I put this stop loss, I was trying to be aggressive. Or in this case, I put a stop loss and I was trying to give it lots of wiggle room. Make those notes. Start putting them in. Just put them in, you know. Over the next couple of days, the next week or so, go put in 20, 30, 40 stop losses around. Come back in a week or two, see what happened, repeat and, and rinse. Because this is very much an art. And the way we get good at this is by doing, and by testing, and by practicing. You know, I can, you know, if, if, if I pull this chart and I take these lines off, and I say where to put it, and there's what, 50 people in the room this evening, we can have 50 different answers. When I looked at this chart, it jumped out at me that there are three possible places and that my preference is the middle one. That's because I've been doing this for a decade plus. So you get that experience by trying, by testing, by looking at different ideas. The risk here is that we, that we con ourselves. But I'm assuming that we're smart enough to, to, to know not to do that to ourselves. The other option is a, t a stop loss with technicals. It's what I call, it can be a dumb stop loss, and I'll show you why in a moment. So, if you're, if you're trading a breakout, you can put it halfway between the range that you were trading. Use your Fibonacci expansions for that. Um, you can use moving average crossovers. So you can say, 
if the 10 goes, if the 7 goes down through the 21, that's my exit. You can use price moving average. So you can say if price goes through 15, that's my exit. Uh, you can use average true range and say twice an average true range, ATR. Um, you can use Bollinger Bands, you can use Volatility Bands in this space. What's nice about this is that it's purely programmatic. So you don't have an, a call on it. It's, you know, when you look at a chart, I always say, the biggest risk to my trading, it's not Janet Yellen or three finance ministers in four days. The risk to my trading is me. I do dumb stuff. And if I've got a position stop losses, the risk is I do it dumb. Whereas here, it's programmatic. There's a, there's a moving average. It's a formula. There's a number that spits out at the other side, and it says, if that number. Because, you know, if I get stopped out and the stock goes to the moon without me, but I got stopped out on a programmatic one, ah, well, you know, but if I drew that line, man, it's my fault. And I kind of got over it, but it still kind of hurts sometimes. So, an example, exactly the same chart. So this happens to be my lazy system, so I use the 30 EMA, which happens to be the blue line. So that blue line is currently my stop loss. This is for Friday close. And what I mean by it's a dumb place, it's a dumb stop loss, because, you know, just a little bit below it's that double one there. And so it doesn't know what else is happening out there. You know, you might be looking at a chart that has massive support, you know, half a percent below your, your, your programmatic, your, your technical uh, stop loss. But they don't know that. The reason I use this is twofold. One, as I said, it completely removes me from the process. Two is I then use the green line for my entry. So that's fine. We fall below, I get out. Because if it runs again, I will get back in. So this thing ain't going to the moon without me. I've got it circled. It can go to the moon, but I'm on that bus. So I've, in a sense, designed that risk out of the process. If your trigger is, th if, if you're using a different methodology to enter and then a MA to exit, you might get out and you might not get the rebuy signal. Whereas here, if I get out and this index starts to run, I will immediately, well, not immediately, but I will pretty quickly get back into the trade. So I'm quite happy that that is a dumb stop loss in a sense. And I'm not using dumb disparagingly, I'm saying it's dumb. It's an unaware stop loss is perhaps a better phrase. And as I say, it's not a disparaging comment, it's just, but it's half designed it into the process. This makes sense. So, and the big thing is, go and just put stop losses everywhere, just to start seeing, and keep notes. So if you take the top 40 shares, if you want to look at equities and say, right, I put the stop loss on Anglo because. I put it on Anglo Platinum because. No, Anglo Platinum is no longer in the top 40. Um, you know, I put it on NASPAS because. And, and, and just go start placing stop losses, getting a sense for what does and doesn't work. What, what, what makes sense to you? One of the key points of trading is what I always say, is the beauty of the market is that we can adapt it to us. And you've got to find what, what makes sense to you because you've got to make it work and you've got to trust it. And the market's quite happy with that. The market says there are 50 of you. You know what? There are a thousand different ways to trade this market. Each one of you can have your own personal, unique process. So here comes the big issue. When do you exit the stop loss? So common conventional wisdom is your stop loss gets touched, you get out immediately. Ah, I don't like that in the least. I think there's some significant problems. So do you stop on touch? Problem is intraday volatility can really hurt you. How many times does a stock, an index or a currency open at the bottom and close at the top? But you got stopped at the bottom. The other bigger issue is that you're looking at a chart and say, for example, a daily range. Okay, so you look at an end of day chart to get a buy signal, but you're then exiting this chart intraday. So you're switching your time frames. The beauty of on touch is that you can make a guaranteed stop loss. You can program it into the broker's system. So you can log on to your stock broker and say, if this thing goes there, sell it. And if you're with IG, you can guarantee that sale. The problem is if you don't do that, and you then have to log on and do it yourself, 
you might start finding reasons why not to. So I've, when I trade my Aussie futures, I've tweaked my stop loss process. Um, and after 16 years and two months of good trading, I was getting stopped out. It was last week sometime, I think. I think it was last week. And it had come to my stop loss level. And what I have to do now is log on and decide, is it going to go on down and slice my stop loss or is it going to bounce? And I caught myself arguing with myself, making up reasons why I shouldn't exit the trade. So then I did the good old-fashioned thing, when in doubt, panic and exit. Now, if I'm arguing with myself, what am I doing? I'm falling into the classic trap of the biggest risk to your trading system is me. And if I'm fighting with me, what there's trouble in paradise. <laughs> so I just closed the position. Turns out I was right because the market carried on falling and falling and falling and falling. But there was that second where I suddenly saw what I was doing. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that after 16 and a half years of profitable trading and 21 total years of trading, even I fall into these traps. This is, a non, this is an ongoing test of your ability. I know that when I fall into the trap, I can recognize it and I know what to do. When I'm in that trap, I exit every time. That's my reserve backup. And that's what happened to me last week or whenever it was. I find myself arguing with myself and my backup rule is, dude, if you're arguing with yourself, you need help and you get the hell out of the stock market. So I did. I, I, not the help part. Well, I drank some red wine later. <coughs> that qualifies, right? So that's on touch. Or do you do it on close? What I mean by on close, if your stop loss is 11 Rand and the share is trading at 10 Rand 90, you technically stopped out, but you wait until the close. And if it's still below at the close, then you exit. And every one of you can see the problem with that. It's at 11.90 now. Sorry, 10.90 now. Stop loss 11. It's at 10.90 now. The problem is that when the close comes, hot mine, it might be 11 rand. It might be 10 rand. Who knows how low it can go? It can get very, very ugly. Excuse me. Um, so you can miss your stop by a margin. You're still going to take it, but it's going to be a whole lot lower. That causes problems with your 2% rule. Remember I said there were two reasons I did 1% rule? This is one of them. The trick is, is that what it does do is it keeps you in trades and it doesn't get you shaken out quite so much. So I do it on my lazy system. Now I must point out my lazy system is an ungeared system. So I don't have that extra gearing to bring the risk to it. But it does mean that if things go horribly wrong, I can miss the stop loss. But in an ungeared index, again, remember one of the earlier presentations, an index is fairly unvolatile. For a stock to move 6, 8, 10% in a day, heck, if you PPC 15% in a day, and of course, the big moves are nearly always down. But even MTN, maybe you were long MTN on, uh, sorry, short MTN on Friday, boom, 15% up. That's why I trade indices. I've never seen an index up 15%. I have seen an index down 15%. Once, October 1987. Many of you weren't born yet. We lost 22% in a day. But it does mean that in an index, if it runs through, I'm less likely to get badly hurt. So my advice, if you're trading equities, and if you're gearing it, then absolutely on touch, on touch. If you're trading indices, if you're trading equities ungeared, and when you've got more experience, and I'm not dissing, it's just it's reality. We have to go through that process of getting the experience. As we gather more experience, we can move to a closed scenario. And what I'm doing is, as I said, with my Aussie futures, I know what my stop loss level is. And when it gets to that level, I get an SMS and I log on and I look at the bids and offers and I make a call. Is this going to break my stop loss or not? And as I said a moment ago, if I can't fundamentally say that it isn't, the default position is exit. Always exit. You can come back another day. 
Hard or soft, in other words, loaded on your broker's system. If you're going to do the touch, absolutely loaded on your broker's system. The volatility can hurt. Do not be worried that the broker can see your stop loss and stuff like that. The broker cannot see your stop loss. It is sitting in a secure database. They do not know nor care where your stop loss is. Your stop loss is not sitting at the JSC. Your broker's system pulls in prices, and when the price that comes in matches your stop loss, it sends your trade to market. So you're not going to get shaken out by your stockbroker, but you might get shaken out by the broader market, as I spoke about a, mo a moment ago. Um, so then fixed or trailing. The other point in stop loss. So trailing is as the trade goes in your direction, you move the stop loss higher. And absolutely you do that. So fixed says you get in and your stop loss is there and you never move it again. Mm, no, terrible idea. The best thing to have is a stop loss so when I got stopped in the Aussie last week, my stop loss was 1,200 points above my entry. So I'm debating about whether I should take profit or not. So you move it up. If you're doing technicals, that will automatically manage that process for you. If you're doing it manually and you're looking at the chart, you're going to have to adjust it. But if you go back to this chart here, uh, too many clicks, too many clicks. That chart there. Let's say we had got into the trade in this middle area here. That bottom white line could have been our stop loss. As it run with that nice break, with that nice break there, we move it up to the middle white line. The current run we saw there, which has now got two red candles, we can move it up to the third one. So this is a manual process where you log on every day and you say, should I adjust it? Be careful of the temptation to be overly aggressive to get that stop loss into profit as quickly as possible. So you've got a trade where you can't lose money in it. But as that trade's running and as it's moving in your favor and as things are playing out, because what are we getting here? I mean, broadly, what have we got? We've got higher highs, bullish. We've got higher lows, bullish. In all instances, edge that stop loss up, eh, don't get excited, but edge it up. And when we run again and we make a new high and we go off the top of the screen, we bring a new stop loss and we put it kind of where this blue line is by that candle there, assuming the next one's green and not so ugly. So we're gently moving it up. Now you can do this and still program it into your broker's account to make it a, a hard stop or a guaranteed stop. But again, this comes back to the point I mentioned a moment ago about go practice stop losses. And if you've got a stop loss and it's working brilliant, the point is, well, now where to move it to are the issues that we need to look at. Uh, one thing with stop losses is they never go down. Unless you're short. But if you're long, stop losses only go up. And if you're using a very short moving average, like a, a single digit moving average, you might find that your moving average goes down. In which case, if the moving average was going up, 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 when it turns, use that high as your exit. Don't take a stop loss down. If you take a stop loss down, you're asking for trouble. Stop losses are always moving up when you're long or down when you're short. But if you're in a long position and you start adjusting a stop loss down, you're suddenly in the middle of a trade taking more risk. That's a terrible idea. And then I come back to fear, and I've spent a lot of time on fear in other presentations, but I come back to fear because stop loss perhaps brings a chunk of it, perhaps the most of it, for a couple of reasons. One, it's where we are most exposed. You know, in terms of the entries and all of that sort of thing, we can, we can put that into systems, we can hard code it, we can do a lot there, but at the stop loss point, we are exposed. Because we are making decisions, we are drawing lines, we are deciding hard or soft, we are deciding touch or close. And that exposes us. It also is where we lose the money. Now in truth, an absence of a stop loss means we lose more, but this is where we lose the money. No one likes losing money. Remember, as I said, in trading, it is a cost of doing business. Any business has costs. If you've got a hot dog stand, your costs are staff and serviettes and hot dogs and rolls and tomato sauce and mustard and everything else. And if you're a trader, your costs are uh, platforms and data and, and subscriptions to, to, to publications and stop losses. You can't afford losing money. You will at times lose money. It is going to happen. 
It's just a cost of doing business. As long as you, when you make money, you make bigger amounts on average, then you're in business. So the fear is, is of losing money. We hate to lose money, but it's 2% of your portfolio. It's a thousand rand. You looked at a thousand rand in your buddy's hands because you didn't want to risk it being your thousand rand. And it's like a couple of notes. As I said, it doesn't even make a bulge in your wallet. And if a thousand rand does scare you, reduce trade size. Make it 1%. Reduce your portfolio size. Get it to that point where it's not a stressful thing to you. You've put a pile of money in the market to grow it, of course. But it's not a straight linear line that goes up. It's a line that goes up and down over time. Over your, the rest of your trading life. This profit line is going to go up, it's going to go down. When it's going up, you think you're a genius. When it goes down, you wish Janet Yellen would get hit by a bus. <laughs> I do not wish Janet Yellen to get hit by a bus, just in case some crazy yank runs her over. Um, they're going to happen, but you've got to be comfortable with that amount. You know, if, you, if your stop loss results in a 10,000 Rand hit and you really can't afford that, you can't action the stop loss and the whole structure starts to, starts to fall apart in a sense. 50 losing trades. Man, that takes skill. Um, so we can reduce to low. It's about concerns about being wrong. As human beings, we want to be right about everything. In truth, we are right about very little, but that never stops us wanting to be right. But remember, I've discussed this about the perfect trade. It's about how we measure ourselves. A stop loss is a good trade. Why? Because you followed the rules. The fact that you lost money is irrelevant. You followed the rules. What can we control in a trade? We can control our entry. We can control the position size. We can control the stop loss. We can control where we put it and whether we make it guaranteed or not. We can control updating that stop loss as the trade moves on. Those are things we can control. What can't we control? Does this trade make profit? If you've got a hundred trades over a trading period of time, if, you are, if you've got a high win ratio, 55, 58% of them have made money. 42, 45% of them have lost you money. If you think those are bad trades, you've got a really bad record. Those are not bad trades as long as you did the right thing. Exiting on a stop loss is the right thing thing because the alternative is going bust that is never the right thing so stop loss is not failure stop loss is about being right the right thing to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons discipline consistency so we talk about that a lot in video seven i'll park that there for now so quickly in closing a lot of this is around having plans. A lot of this, yeah, the stop, this risk fits in almost at the end of the process. The beginning of the process is what am I trading? Why am I trading it? We've gone through those. Open demo accounts, start playing with things. Look at this guaranteed stop. As I said, go in and, and pick 50 stocks and put a stop loss on every one. The call center will think you're completely crazy. Why is this Oak put 50 alerts on our system? He hasn't got two bucks in the account. If they phone you, Tell him Simon says. <laughs> Even if they don't know who Simon is, no one ever argues with Simon says. It's just an innate law of nature. Start playing with it. Start seeing how it works. Start seeing what works for you. What works for me and obvious to me in a stop loss scenario might not be for you. We can debate how to do it. We can debate where to put the stop loss. We can debate hard or soft. We can debate all of that. The one thing we cannot debate is should we have a stop loss. Yes, we must have a stop loss. You've got to find what works for you. And that is both, as I said a moment ago, the beauty of trading is that it's unique. It's also the challenge of trading. You know, if you want to be, I don't know, uh, uh, an expert sign writer, uh, there's a process. You know, you go and you follow and you, you, you do the sign writing and there's like a way to sign write. And there's almost a comfort in knowing that you just do what that oak does, because he did what that oak does, and you know, all will be okay. The problem with trading is you, you can do what that oak did, but it might not be comfortable, and then you've got to change it. And that kind of makes us a little bit edgy. That's fine. That edginess is, 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 is perfectly fine. It's, it's not a bad thing at all. It's about you finding that space. 
finding what does work for you. And it takes time. Uh, yeah. 20 plus years into trading, I'm probably quite close to finding it, I think. Pretty short somewhere around the lazy part, because I'm big on lazy. Doesn't mean I haven't been profitable, it just means that we, we're always learning. We're always learning about markets, we're always learning about ourselves. Stefan said something to me this afternoon, which I think is the most brilliant thing I've heard all year. And not the first thing I've heard all year, and don't be silly, I learned something yesterday too, and probably the day before. Always be learning. Always be ready to say, that is really smart, and I'm going to steal it. Don't be scared to steal. Do be scared to steal. Oh, Don't be scared to take <laughs> clever ideas. Um, this is the old one from last time. Again, back to the questions. Again, to that. Again, to that. Uh, I'm going to park it there for now. So, boot camp done. We kick off again with the master class next month. What we're really doing with that is taking it to the next point. These have been the theories. Now we start getting seriously practical in the process um, and start taking it from there on. Uh, as always, lawyers. We love the lawyers. <laughs> I've run my time, but if there's a question or two, so. Personally for me is taking a profit. Oof, but it's, it's hardest thing in the whole wide world. Hardest thing in the world is taking a profit. Mm. Oh, what must I do? <laughs> I so, because no. I, think, I think once um, said it in one of your presentations, <coughs> the mistakes that many traders do is they, they let um, the losses run. Yeah. And Take profits too quick. So I agree with you 100%. The hardest thing about trading is when to take a profit. Because if you want to watch the stock go to the moon, sell and profit. Man, that thing is watching and it goes without you. So there's a couple of things. So certain technical analysis processes, head and shoulders and pennants and flags, they have targets. That's like it. That's well and good. But I don't use those. So now we're completely out on our own. So what do we do for it? So I do one of two things. I only exit on stop loss which sounds crazy, but it means, no, so I've got my lazy system, which is ungeared. I've got trades at plus 100%. Now, if you're trading ungeared on in an index, you know, it, that trade ran for three years almost. If you're ungeared in an index, you're never going to hold, you know, three, no, you're not going to get in and say, I'm here for three years, but it didn't stop me. It just went and went and went, and I'm a trend trader, so it ran like hell. What I then otherwise do is I, as I scale my way out. So I'll buy in tranches of three. So I would never buy 500, I would buy 450 or 600. And then as it runs, block 150, 150, or 200, 200, scale you out. So when do you do it? Say you, random numbers, you're entering at 12, your stop loss is 10. So your stop loss is two round. First third at 14, next third at 16, last third, let stop on. So that the first third, I take at one stop loss distance, second third at two stop loss distance, third third only at stop loss that one i'm leaving there because occasionally and in truth if i ran the numbers i'm probably a fool but i'm you know if it goes to the moon i'm on board it just goes to the moon so seldom i'm probably better off than taking it but that i agree with you hardest part and 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 the pr that's my answer then dirt and thirds so stop loss value plus one exit plus two exit last third but then you've moved your stop loss higher see how it goes Ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there. Uh, quick bit of housekeeping. Parking tickets, get them stamped as you head out so you don't pay. Um, as I said, this has been our 12th boot camp. We've been here a year. Uh, many familiar faces, so obviously you got something from it. I hope you did. I've had a huge amount of fun. I've learned stuff. One of the things, and I love teaching. One of the reasons I love teaching is because you learn as well as much as, 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 as help others learn. Um, but I hope you have benefited from it. The entire series, we've got like 12 hours there, is online. And we kick off with our new one uh, next month. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for your time over the course of the year. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>